reply to what uh, George Stuff has just said. Okay. Thank you very much, George, for that enlightening presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, George has made 15 points and many subsidiary points. I'll try my best to deal with all of these points in some way. We don't have time in 10 minutes to cover all of the areas. However, some of the areas have already been covered in my booklet and I would recommend that when you go away from here today, you take that with you and study that carefully. For example, there's one section of this booklet entitled Some Misunderstood Verses in the Bible. So, verses which are often misunderstood as if they teach that Jesus is God, but these do not teach that Jesus is God. Look in the booklet for the full explanation of that. Now, to continue on, I had asked a question in my presentation, and I feel that this question has not yet been answered. Who was the first person who discovered that Jesus is God, and what was the thing that led that person to discover it? Was it Mark? Was it Matthew? Was it Luke? Was it John? Was it Paul? This is what we need to be stated very clearly and concisely, and we need to see the evidence that led that person to that conclusion. Now, the first point that uh, George did make for us is that uh, God and man is one person. If you read the whole of the Bible, this is what you find. Men and women, I've been reading the whole of the Bible, and I've not found that conclusion. And many people who are Christians, who believe in Jesus, they call themselves Unitarian Christians. They do not believe that Jesus is God, although they have been reading the Bible throughout their lives. In fact, I have shown evidence one after another that if you read the Bible, the clear evidence that comes out is that Jesus is not God. And there are many evidences, many Bible verses which are quoted for that. Point number two, that the writers did not have the full understanding of Jesus. The writers of the New Testament did not have that full understanding and that their understanding progressed over time because God gives us a progressive revelation. Well, men and women, why should it stop at the Council of Nicaea? In fact, it didn't stop at the Council of Nicaea. In 325 AD, at the Council of Nicaea, the bishops got together and they decided to call Jesus a very God of very God. Then, when some people had a question about the Holy Spirit, they, another council was called at, Cal at uh, Ephesus in 431 to decide about the Holy Spirit. Then, when someone said that we should not call Mary the mother of God, another council was held, the Council of Constantinople to decide whether or not Jesus or Mary can be called the mother of God. And then finally another council was called in 451, the Council of Chalcedon, to decide finally the, the final wording that will be handed down to the churches as to what you should say concerning the Nicene Creed. Now we see that the revelation keeps progressing then if it is a progressive revelation, but why should it stop at year 451? Why should it not keep progressing and we should further fine-tune and decide further what we should believe about Jesus? Men and women, Muslims and Christians believe that there is one God who reveals his message through his prophets and messengers and that is the message that should be followed. It is not up for human beings to speculate and to hold councils to decide what they must believe, but they must believe that faith which was taught by God's prophets and messengers, but not to formulate new doctrines of faith. The doctrines of faith for Muslims and Christians start with the first commandment, which is there in the Bible and again in the Quran, that there is only one God. In the Old Testament, that doctrine of faith was recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Then in the New Testament, Jesus repeated that commandment in Mark chapter 12, verse 27. The Quran repeats that commandment by saying, Wa ilahukum ilahu wahid, la ilaha illa huwa rahmanur rahim. And your God is one God, there is no God except Him, the beneficent, the merciful. In Surah 2, Ayah number 106. So that is the faith that Muslims and Christians should follow. Not a faith that was formulated by people later on saying that God is one in three or three in one. You will never find any such statement in the Bible anywhere that God is either one in three or three in one. You will not find the word Trinity or any such term that was decided upon in these church councils. So that progressive revelation should have stopped with Jesus. What Jesus said, that is what Christians should hold on to. Because Jesus on whom be peace is recorded in the Gospel of John as having said, If you are my true disciples, you will hold on to my teaching. You will hold on to my words and then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. He did not say you should decide in church councils what you're going to believe. We're told that in point number three, with many subsidiary points, that there are references in the Old Testament which show that there is another person within the person of God, or within the Godhead there is another person apart from Jehovah. These passages will take some time to explain, we don't have time to explain that now. But I will say, uh, 
I will say as a very broad statement that if any one of the Old Testament passages had indicated any such belief, the people, the readers of the Old Testament would have held that belief. And the teachers of the Old Testament, the prophets who came from God one after the other, Jeremiah, Hosea, and all of them, would have made this doctrine very clear that there are three persons in one God, there is a Trinity God, that is what you must believe. But none of them made that belief clear, and in no text of the New Testament either do we find from any writer of the New Testament that any such belief is to be held. Continuously we find them affirming that there is only one God, and that does not include Jesus. Now, point number four. We are told that in Malachi is one reference. In Malachi, that it is clearly stated that the Lord will come to His temple. This verse is often misunderstood. George, if you look in Malachi chapter 3, where you have referred to the last verses, you will notice that there are two words there spelled L-O-R-D. But one is spelled L-O-R-D in upper and lower case, and the other is spelled L-O-R-D in all upper case. And the reason for that difference is that wherever the name Jehovah or Yahweh occurs in the Old Testament in the Hebrew language, the translators have written it as L-O-R-D in all uppercase. But where the Greek or the Hebrew Adonai is there in the Old Testament, the translators have spelt it out L-O-R-D in upper and lower case, distinguishing between Adonai and Yahweh. Let me remind you men and women that the Hebrew term Yahweh, that's the term that's given as the name of God in the Bible. Whereas the term Adonai, meaning our Lord or the Lord, can apply both to God and to human beings as a title of respect. Just as in the English language we may say the house of lords. It does not mean that it's a house full of gods. But when we, when we address the person as our Lord, we mean to express respect for that person, not to call him God necessarily. So that passage then cannot be used as a proof that the one who is going to come to his temple is God Almighty. In fact, quite the opposite. Because the one who is going to come to the temple is called Adonai, whereas the other one is called Yahweh, and Yahweh in the Old Testament again and again says, I am Yahweh, besides me there is no other, there was no God formed before me, or after me there shall be no other. Read chapters Isaiah chapter 43 to 45, and these statements are reported again and again in that book of Isaiah. Another Old Testament proof is Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 where it is claimed that it is said that a child is born, a son is given, his name will be called Everlasting Father, Mighty God, Prince of Peace and so on and so forth. Men and women, there are many titles given for the one who is spoken of there. If we take the passage literally, then that one who is spoken of is also, as he is called Mighty God, he is also called Everlasting Father in the same passage. If we take it literally, then Jesus is both the Mighty God and the Everlasting Father. Right? If you take it literally. However, when Jesus was on the earth, according to Matthew chapter 23 verse 9, He said, Do not call anyone on earth your father, because you have only one father who is in heaven. Jesus therefore is not the father. So we must turn to a figurative interpretation of that verse. We must say, well, when it says everlasting father, then Jesus is not really the father. Well then, if He's not really the father, also He's not really the mighty God. If we take a literal interpretation, there's a contradiction. If we take a figurative interpretation, let's go all the way, and that does not prove that Jesus is mighty God. Moving on to point number uh, six. John the Baptist and the purpose of his coming, according to Mark, was to reveal uh, the coming of the Lord, or to prepare the way for the Lord. Actually, to use Mark's statement. Mark says that this is found in Isaiah, but as George has rightly pointed out, Mark has made a slight mistake and has not found this only in Isaiah, but this is a combination from a text of Isaiah and also from Malachi chapter number 3. However, that aside, uh, Mark is just showing us that John the Baptist is preparing the way of the Lord. John the Baptist does not say that the Lord is going to come and walk in that way and that that Lord is going to be Jesus. However, we do notice a development in the story. As I've pointed out before, here is another example. If you move away from Mark and you go to Matthew, Luke and John, you will find that Matthew, Luke and John has improved the story so as to identify Jesus as the one exactly whom G John the Baptist was speaking about. Till 
When we go to the Gospel according to John, we find John the Baptist pointing out, Behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the Son of God I was speaking to you about. Whereas in the previous three records, in Matthew, Mark and Luke, that declaration from John was simply not there. According to Matthew and Luke, John had to send his disciples much later to Jesus to find out, Are you the one who is to come or must we look for another? How come in John the story has developed to such an extent that now John the Baptist in the very same event has already declared Jesus to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? How many, many minutes? Uh, you've got about two minutes. Two minutes more. Okay. Now to move along very quickly, uh, point number seven. That in Matthew it is shown that uh, Jesus legislates. Well, men and women, any prophet from God, once he has already demonstrated his authority as that, that he's speaking on God's behalf, he can say that this is the law, do this, do that. He's speaking not on his own behalf, but on behalf of God. And J Jesus has said repeatedly, I can say nothing of my own authority. What I teach is what I heard from the Father, and so on and so forth. So Jesus did not have the authority to teach his own law, but he had to teach what has been taught to him. As he said, I'm a man who told you the truth which I heard from God. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says that you will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, and I will be deciding your case. If you did not follow the commandments, I will say, get away from me, workers of iniquity. The Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, will say the same thing. When his claimed followers go to him, and they, do, they are not really true followers, the Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, will say, take them away, take them away. Mark chapter 2 verse 5 of point number 9 We are told that Jesus was able to forgive sins But if you refer to Matthew chapter 9 verse 8 You will see that the people who were there and they observed this event It says there in Matthew chapter 9 verse 8 They praised God who had given such authority to men Men and women we don't have time to go through all of the points However what is quite clear is that if we are willing to study these passages in detail If we are willing to take the passages clearly Understanding that first of all the New Testament writers had that faith of Israel that there is only one God who is called Yahweh in the Old Testament that he is one he doesn't have any partners there are none beside him he doesn't have any sons or daughters nothing like that that one God is the same God who is being taught by the New Testament writers it is true that John and Paul has taught something more about Jesus teaching that he is more than a man he is exalted he is between God and man according to Paul 1st Timothy chapter 2 verse 15 Jesus is a mediator between man and God so definitely he is much higher than human beings Muslims will not accept that but if he is a mediator between man and God then he is also lower than God and Christians also do not accept that Paul according to the first letter to the Corinthians chapter 11 verse 3 he said the head of every woman is her husband the head of every man is Christ and the head of Christ is God so you have women, men, Christ, God. So Christ is way above human beings. Muslims do not want to accept that. But at the same time, he is below God and Christians also do not want to accept that. What we have to do, both Muslims and Christians, is to get back to the original faith which was taught by Jesus, that he is the Messiah of God, he is a prophet, he is a messenger, he is teaching the truth which came from God. And if you want the truth that will set you free, you have to hold on to the words of Jesus, what he taught, and what was initially recorded before it got developed into the stories of, of Matthew, Luke, John and the writings of Paul. Let us go back to the earliest records we can find and there you will find the true Jesus. Men and women, I thank you very much for your patient listening. Um, as Brother Shabir took, let's see, two minutes extra, I, I give George Duff two minutes extra as well to reply. Thank you again. From Brother Shabir Ali's two speeches, I want to um, draw your attention to 14 points by way of reply. Um, the first thing that I would draw your attention to is the fact that it is Peter who gives the full statement of who Christ is in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16 and verse 18 where he declares whenever Christ says, who do men say that I am? Some say one of the prophets, well who do you say that I am? And he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now whenever he says the Son of the living God, he is taken above the, um, the statement with regards to Messiahship. He is not simply repeating it as if the King of Israel was spoken of as the Son of God. And how could it be taken above that? Well it must be, here is one 
whom God himself has declared to be his son. And there is a co-equality between the Father and the Son with regards to actual essence. You will find that Christ goes on and says, You are blessed, Simon, because flesh and blood, natural ability, um, comprehensive understanding has not revealed this to you. But my Father in heaven is the one who has revealed it. And so that is the first coming to a realization of who they were dealing with. It's also interesting that Brother Shabir Ali has spoken of the Gospels being later writings. I'm not sure whether this has come across in the television in um, Canada, but in recent months over the media, they have found writings from the Gospel of Matthew from around AD 50. It is well known that most of the Gospels were written around the AD 60, 63, 65 period. And so therefore we have writings um, recorded from an earlier stage with regards to the Gospels. Secondly, I would come to the place where um, the, the, the brother has raised the, the um, situation of those going into to paganized um, societies that are recorded in the missionary journeys in the book of Acts and there they are taken and there they are um, claimed to be gods because of the way that they were acting well that might be in a paganized um, society, that might be in the midst of a pantheon of gods but the situation into which Jesus Christ came was not that but it was into the heart of monotheism. It was into the heart of the one God religion. And you cannot then take a cultural scenario of Judaism and of Israel and a, a cultural scenario of a paganized society and begin to develop the same argument. Because you're dealing with a different people. And you're dealing there with a people with a different understanding. When I spoke of progressive revelation... I was speaking at that particular moment of the Old Testament unfolding and I think that was clear to those that were listening that I was dealing with the angel of the Lord in the early chapters of Genesis. I was not saying that the same thing applies into the new in the same way that there is this unfolding. God took 1,500 years before sending Messiah to declare his person and his redemptive work so that the people might have an understanding neither is it true to say that any Protestant would give on to church councils the place of bringing forth that which is to be believed the place that we give to councils the place that was held at Nicaea the place that was held at um, Chelsea and the place that has been held right down to the Senate of Dirt at the time of the Reformation was that what the, the council is there for is to search into that which God has revealed and then to formulate it in a particular um, doctrinal expression of the truth that is within the pages of the Word of God. It is not to um, develop new doctrine. That is not accepted. And if the council or a confession states the point which is at variance with the word of God, then we are duty bound as evangelical Protestant believers to submit our minds to the bar of Holy Scripture and to discount the council and the doctrinal formula rather than to contradict the word of God. So it certainly does not go on into Nicaea and post Nicaea. What happened at Nicaea was that the truth was brought into a particular expressed formula against the Arian heresy that had raised itself at that time. And indeed, Athanasius, the one who stood for the truth, at one point stood alone and because of his adherence to the Bible as the word of God, when he was told, on the world is against you. He was able to say with conviction and clarity, then I am against all the world. So it's important that Muslims understand the place that we give to, um, to counsel. 
In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, we're told great is the mystery of godliness. And then it goes on to say, He was manifested in the flesh. There may be some discrepancy over the particular word, whether it is He or whether it is God, but in the contents and texts must be examined in context. Paul is speaking there of God. Paul is arguing from godliness where God is mentioned and he must therefore on the grammatical structure be addressing us concerning God when he says he was manifested in the flesh and so there is a New Testament doctrinal formulation which gives this teaching of God coming in human form which the church had in its possession even in the time of the writing of the canon and which was adhered to. Um, Malachi 3 verse 1 is in the above case. It is not written in the lower case. Lord, I don't know, is translated with the capital lettering throughout. In Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. In Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, we're not speaking here of Jesus as being the Father in that of God the Father. Now I cannot at this stage in the afternoon go into a full developed understanding of the tri-personality within the Trinity. But what has been said here is that He is the Father of eternity. In other words, His relationship to His people is fatherly. It is a comforting message that is given to them of who the rescuer is to be and so there is no confusion with regards to Mark we find that John the Baptist states in Mark 1 verse 7 that he is unable to lose the shoes of the prophet Jesus to use a Muslim understanding. Now, I would like Brother Shabir Ali from an Islamic perspective to explain to me whether there is an equality within prophethood, how one who was but a prophet can speak of another who was but a prophet and nothing more than a prophet. How it is that he is unworthy um, to lose stone and then lose his shoes. John the Baptist clearly had a greater understanding of who the Christ was than that he was a mere prophet among others. He seen that he was coming to prepare the way of the Lord. And when he sends his disciples, is it not reassuring to them that this one who is the Christ has come and has fulfilled the, the mandate that was given to the Christ in the healing of the sick in the, in the um, preaching of the gospel to the poor and John has no quarrels whenever they go back and they, and they say yes he fulfills the mandates of the Christ and another thing that John asks there is this which is very interesting in Muslim Christian discussion are you the coming one or do we need to look for another now when John reached the conclusion and his disciples reached the conclusion that Jesus was the coming one we can only conclude that there is no need for another and I think that is self-explanatory Brother Shabir Ali has not taken up that which I specifically asked him to address himself to I drew his attention to Titus chapter 2 verse 13 to Romans chapter 9 verse 5 where Paul speaks of Christ as being our great God and Saviour and where he says Christ is God over all forever blessed. Amen. You will remember that I drew his attention to that and in his comments he has not um, brought that up. He mentioned the, the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where the apostle is speaking and he is saying that man is the head over woman as God is the head over Christ. Now I admittedly in a few moments at the end of my address sought to develop with you this the anthropon, 
this God man that Paul come to an understanding of in Christ assuming to himself human nature by way of submission and, and um, adding human nature to his, to his divine nature in other words not that God is man but that in Christ you have one who is truly and properly God and one who is truly and properly man in one person. And I think at one point Brother Shabir Ali um, put it over as if I was saying that God and man are the same thing. I'm not saying that at all. I am saying that God has taken human nature. But that does not mean to say that God and man are the same thing. Indeed there was an occasion when I was asked to take another debate, is God man? And I said I cannot debate under that title. Because in the very essence of God, He is Spirit. And therefore there is nothing to debate. Now in the Corinthian passage, Christ's humiliation has been brought into, into play with regards to the fact that He has humbled Himself under God. But it's interesting that there you find that the Apostle says that man is the head of woman. Now as far as Christian sisters are concerned, and I would dare suggest it is the same for Muslim sisters. You would not see yourself as subordinated with regards to your actual um, personhood to a man. If you do, well, I, I feel very sorry for you. But we see our sisters as being equal to us with regards to their actual dignity of personhood. However, there are different roles that they have to play. And there is a role of headship and there is a role of submission, but it does not change from the dignity of personhood. So if Christ has submitted himself to God for a purpose, that does not address itself in and of itself explicit, explicitly to his personhood. Well, these are about a few of the things that were raised, and I, um, I will conclude at that. Back to her. Uh, it's right. I think. I think if you just want to move over, then. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, George, for bringing these points to my attention. I will begin by referring to the passages which you asked me to refer to, namely Titus chapter two, verse thirteen. You mentioned two passages where Paul specifically called Jesus God, in reference to my claim that there is no undisputed passage in the Bible where Jesus is called God. You have given me two passages from Paul. One is Titus chapter 2 verse 13. My reply to that is that if you check the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, the New English Bible, today's English version of the Bible, commonly called Good News Bible, the New American Bible, in all of these versions of the Bible you will say that in Titus chapter 2 verse 13, it does not say our great God and Savior, but it says of our great God and of our Savior, Jesus making a clear distinction between God and Jesus and we cannot use this as a proof. If you believe one translation might be more reliable but still there's an element of doubt you cannot use that as a 100% proof to hang such an important doctrine of faith. When the whole Bible everywhere else has been saying that one other than Jesus is God and this is the best example or one of the best examples to prove that he is God when this is debatable as to his translation we have to leave this alone and go on to something on more solid ground. Secondly, Romans chapter 9 verse 5, where, Jesus, where Christ is apparently called God. Well, you don't have to go very far for this one, George. If you look in your NIV footnote, you will see in the NIV footnote it points out that the reading in the text is not the necessary reading, but it can also be a full stop after Christ. And then it says, God who is over all be forever praised. So making again a clear distinction between Jesus and God, translating that passage one way seems to indicate that Jesus is God, translating it another way brings it in harmony with all of the rest of the Bible and teaches again that Jesus is not God. Now going on to the other passages which uh, George kindly drew my attention to, starting with the first point very quickly. Now. Now when Pe the, the reply that was given from Peter, we compared Matthew, Mark and Luke and we showed that the more developed form is there in Matthew. Uh, George feels that this was Peter's full reply that is given in Matthew. However, 
we have already shown that this is a development in the story. If Peter had given the full reply calling Jesus Son of God, that would definitely have been recorded in Mark because Mark would be interested in letting his readers know that Jesus was discovered to be the Son of God. However, that was never done. In fact, this was, uh, there is a sort of a, a difficulty in, in accepting this story when Jesus said to Peter that you did not discover this on your own, but this was revealed to you. From this, no human source revealed this to you, but this was given to you by the Heavenly Father. However, going to the Gospel of John, we do find that Peter got this from a human source because it was his brother Andrew that told him much way before this particular incident. In John chapter 1, you can find that stated. Or chapter 2, my memory does not serve me that accurately, but you can find it. Now, the Gospels are written early, we are told. However, early or late, the phenomenon is still there. That among them, you have early ones and you have later ones. Earlier ones and later ones. And you can see the development in the story from the earlier ones to the later ones. And we believe that if I can find, if we can find a gospel which is earlier even than Mark, we will notice again development in the story between Mark and the prior gospel. The way we can notice the development in Matthew and in John and in Paul's writings is because we can compare that with what is already written in Mark. We don't have anything to compare Mark with and so we cannot discover where Mark has done some of the same thing following the same kind of trends. Now, the examples we gave where people took human beings to be gods, George rightly pointed out, these were pagans. And that was the, they were products of the pagan society so they can take human beings to be God. And this exactly is my point. That the writers of the Bible could not possibly take a human being for God. And this is why nowhere in the Bible have they said that. We must not misunderstand their writings and somehow force their writings to give birth to what was developed as a result of pagan influence later on, taking a human being to be God. In other words, the councils later on was responding to the faith that was developed by people who were already influenced by paganism and Hellenistic views over the centuries that followed the raising of Jesus, peace be upon him, to heaven. So we must return to that original faith which was preached in the monotheistic atmosphere, where Peter recorded in the book of Acts of the Apostles, never called Jesus God, never called Jesus Son of God, but always refers to him as servant of God, Messiah, Christ. And these are the things that Muslims believe today, the same faith which was being taught in that monotheistic atmosphere recorded in the book of Acts. The angel of the Lord in the, is not necessarily there in the New Testament, and that's true, George, because in the New Testament, there are more than one angel of the Lord, because one is called an angel of the Lord, who let Peter out of the prison. Another angel of the Lord let uh, Paul out of prison, or perhaps the same one, but an angel of the Lord, indicating that they might be several. In the Gospel according to Luke as well, there is angel of the Lord, and again, with the indefinite article, an angel of the Lord, there must be many of these. The councils, we are told, did not teach us any new doctrine, but they only formulated a response to the heresies. But they got the same teaching which was there in the Bible. And this is our challenge today, men and women, to go back to the Bible and find a single reference anywhere in any undisputed text where it says that Jesus is God, specifically that. That Jesus is not shy enough to, sit, to, to speak about his Godhead, but he speaks like Yahweh in the Old Testament. I am God, besides me there is no other. You must worship me and none else. Any such statement in the Bible cannot be found. So that's all the time I have for you today, except for one quick reference concerning 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. This is advanced as an evidence that the Bible does teach that Jesus is God. But all that pop passage says in the version that George read to us is that godliness was manifest in the flesh. Saying that godliness was manifest in the flesh is much different from saying God was manifest in the flesh. This is not a sufficient declaration to prove that Jesus is God. And somebody had recognized this and changed it to read God was manifest in the flesh. And this is how it reads in the King James Version of the Bible. But modern translations have corrected that forgery and restored the original to read that godliness was manifest in the flesh. Men and women, I thank you very much for your patient listening. I hope that you will study the book which I presented to you. Many of these points are elaborated further with references to the Bible chapter and verse numbers. You owe it to yourself to read this book if you want to study this matter a little bit more carefully and thoroughly. Again, I thank you for your patient listening. I apologize if I said something that may have hurt anyone or may have been um, considered offensive to anyone. It is not my intention to hurt anyone or to belittle anyone's faith, but it is my intention that since I know something which God has guided me to, then it is my obligation, my moral right or my moral obligation to share with my fellow brothers and sisters in humanity that little bit of knowledge which I know. If it is wrong, then it's between me and God. I pray to God that he should forgive me for my errors and forgive you as well. Well. And if it is right, I pray to God that he should guide all of us
to follow that particular truth. My final words are, praise be to God, the Lord of the worlds. Thank you. With regards to the reply that has been made to both Titus 2.13 and also Romans 9.5, um, it is not repetitive. The structure simply says, Our great God and Saviour. Um, and it would of necessity need to be repetitive. There has, to my knowledge, there has not been that much of a reliable manuscript produced wherein this is repetitive. You will find that Unitarians will insist in tampering with the text, but I would like reliable manuscript material to, um, to work on before I would be willing to conclude uh, viable in other interpretation to it. And also, whenever we look at Romans 9, 5, the Apostle is speaking there of the great privileges that have come to the, to the Jewish people under the old economy. Why then would he suddenly move off his theme and introduce praise to God our Saviour whenever he is speaking there of the human ancestry of Christ? This is the greatest privilege that he is stating to them because of who Christ is and that he was born of their lineage. Um, I see no place with text in context for another interpretation whatsoever. Whenever we come to Andrew's words to um, Peter, Brother Shabir Ali has said that um, it was not revealed to Peter by, um, by his God, Christ Father in heaven, but rather that his brother Andrew had told him it is specifically stated in John 1, 41. We have found the Messiah, Christ, who, sorry, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. What Andrew realized was that the Messiah had come. That's what he told Peter. But as Peter spent this time with Christ, as the disciples spent this time with Christ, as Christ had revealed his person to them before going on to speak of his work to them, he says, well, who do men say that I am? And men have begun to develop a variety of opinion, as already said. And then he says, who do you say that I am? Now Andrew has said that we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. But Peter has come here to a full understanding of who the Christ is. The Christ, by his ontology, by the essence of his Nature is none other than the Son of the living God. This is not that which Andrew said to him. This is a later development that Peter come to an understanding of as he had spent time with the human Jesus. Whenever we come to the question of the angel of the Lord, I did not use the New Testament at all. Brother Shabir Ali has addressed himself to the New Testament. I specifically said that I was dealing with the Old Testament. And as a matter of fact, the early part of the Old Testament, Genesis into Exodus, some of the first revelation that was given. Now not only am I arguing on the basis of the article, I am arguing on the basis of how the angel conducts himself, how he speaks in the name of Jehovah, how he makes promises in the name of Jehovah. Indeed, we're told that God himself says that he will put his name into the angel. God's name stands for his personage. It is the identity behind the name. And God is speaking of this angel and then the table put his name into him. In Isaiah, we're told that the, the face of God shone upon them in the angel. In other words, if they were to see God, if they were to have an understanding of God, a perception of that who God is, then they would see it in the angel. So it's not a matter of simply asking whether the article precedes the um, term for angel or not. It is a matter of the angel acting that reveals to us that we are dealing with more than a simple um, angelic messenger. I would also draw your attention to the manner in which Christ responded 
whenever he received worship. You see, in Acts 14, Brother Shabir Ali spoke of how the apostles went to the people and they said, the gods have come among us and they give Barnabas a particular name and also Paul. And they were beginning to tear their clothes and give homage to them. And they says, but we are men. You are not to behave in this way. Now how different it was whenever Thomas comes in John's Gospel chapter 20 verses 28 and 29 and Thomas says there of Christ my Lord and my God we're told that Thomas said unto him Thomas is addressing him and as he addresses him he addresses him as both Lord and God did Christ say Thomas stop such idolatrous behavior stop committing shirk this is blasphemy this is the only sin that will not be forgiven no brother quite the opposite that is the way Barnabas and Paul were acting but not so Christ to Thomas he says because you have seen you have believed believed what? believe that declarative statement which has been the confession of the church ever since but Jesus Christ is both our Lord and our God. Blessed, happy are those who have not seen and yet believe. Not seen, not seen Christ as he walked among us and yet believed. How? How are we to believe that which we have not seen? Christians do not believe myths. That which we adhere to is historical. It took time in space and history. So how are we to believe? Well, we are to believe because the apostles went out with their message, the apostles went out with their charisma, their proclamation. And these things have been written down in the book of God so that the church of all ages has it. So that we can believe even though we haven't seen. Brother Shabir Ali, I do thank you for the manner in which you have conducted this afternoon. I have listened to tapes of debates etc taking place and I am pleased to say that you have kept yourself to the subject without interrupting and bantering. I do thank you for that. I also apologize if I have offended anyone in anything I have said and we do look to God alone who can add his authentication to the truth to grant, is, to grant us into that which is true and that which will one day enable us to stand before him. I'm sure we'd both want to thank both speakers. Um, and uh, we have started late, so we are going to have a much reduced question time now. Um, right, after I've sifted through the questions. Um, what are, we'll have questions up until... Um,